I want to thank you so much for joining us. I'm Mark Schumacher, the CEO of the Home Furnishings Association, and this is one of our weekly webinars and um, couldn't be more timely. Here we are coming toward the end of the first month of 2023. What a better time to check in with a couple of experts we have, not only a, a micro, but also a macro look at our economy, consumer spending, all these things that matter to you and your business. So we will get to that right away and I'll introduce the panel in just a second, but I want to uh, do a little bit of housekeeping here. Um, this is gonna be recorded. So if there are um, any you know, any coworkers or members of, of your uh, team that you wanna share this with afterwards, we will send you the link and you can then, of course, on demand, watch this webinar. All of our webinars are stored at myhfa.org forward slash webinars so there's a wonderful library there if you need it also you'll notice on the right side of your screen there is a small chat box if you have questions feel free to place those questions uh, in the chat box we will do our best to get to all of those during this time and i also want to thank synchrony because synchrony is hfa's thought leadership sponsor they support not only webinars like this but also seminars that we have at markets we will have some starting this weekend in las vegas and also uh, member solution rooms as well so our thanks for synchrony for that but let's uh let's just get to it um i am pleased to introduce uh some good friends uh, to hfa here um peter keith is the uh is a managing director for piper sandler he's a senior analyst uh in our retail space and uh, for those of you that enjoy those uh quarterly reports that uh, piper sandler and hfa collaborate on. Uh, Peter is the author of those and takes a very strong uh, look at our industry, also betting as well. So he brings a, a wealth of knowledge to this talk today. And also joining us is Jake Ubena. Jake is the senior economist for Piper Sandler. And um, so we're also you know, looking for, for him to give us some, some ideas about what it is we're seeing out there. And guys, first of all, thank you for joining us. As always, it's, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I just want to start with uh, news of the day today. You know, this uh, first thing when I sat down this morning, got a blurb from uh, from uh, the New York Times that said the U.S. economy grew at a 2.9% annual rate in the fourth quarter. Um, they referred to it as a solid pace that reflected the resilience of consumers and businesses. Okay, that sounds great. Jake, I see you with a slight smirk on your face. So let's, let's start there. And uh, is that really the sort of the rosy news that they seem to want us to think it is? So th that's the problem when you have uh, journalists digesting GDP reports, right? It's all about the top line. Uh, the problem with with this morning's number, uh, and it, it did, it came out, it came in, you know, first blush strong, 2.9%. The issue is inventory accumulation in the quarter and massive decline in imports, which is additive to GDP, um, accounted for about 2.1 percentage points of that 2.9, right? So putting it in perspective, it was really the accumulation of inventory. It was really the big decline in imports, consumer goods imports in particular, both related to the same thing, which I'm gonna actually uh, get into, both related to the unwinding of this massive bubble in goods spending that we saw over the course of the pandemic, right? Now we're normalizing consumption in a lot of these goods areas and imports have come down from record highs in the first half of, of 22. They've completely normalized. They've actually blown through uh, the pre-COVID baseline now uh, and with it, inventory accumulation has continued to pace. You're seeing this bullwhip effect where retail demand throttles down, retail inventory start building. Now you're seeing inventory building on the wholesale side. You're seeing manufacturing slow down in response to that. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, the GDP top line, sort of the way it's the way it's pulled together and, and, and the way they aggregate it looks good at 2.9, but you have to remember a lot of that is for, for reasons that are not good from a domestic demand standpoint. Private domestic demand which is an internal component of, of this report, sort of the purest measure of demand, was only up two tenths quarter over quarter annualized in the fourth quarter. So um, again, just a, a, a bit a bit of a nuanced number once you get into the details here. Well, and, and I appreciate this. I think this is a great start because you know you've just you just already talked about um, two things that are going to be thematic over this next hour, and that is that we're seeing demand continue to slow yet inventory is growing and, and the disparity therein. So uh, listen, why don't you go ahead? I know that you've prepared some um, some uh, PowerPoint pages here. Let's walk through this bit by bit. Um, and just everybody that's joining us, I want you to know this is this is real time stuff here. So these uh, this information is is as as fresh as it can be right at the moment. And Jake, we'll start with you and then we'll we'll go over to uh, Peter. But Peter, do chime in at any point here. OK. Sure. So I'll, I'll cover the broad strokes and, and more specifically how we're looking at the, con the consumer to unfold this year. 
Uh, bottom line, we think we're heading into a recession. We think uh, federal uh, Fed policy is exacerbating the downtrend that was already in tow as we unwind the massive fiscal stimulus that we saw over the course of the last couple of years. Uh, the Fed tightening way above the neutral rate is only going to make things worse as we move through the balance of 23. When we look at the tea leaves of the economy, sort of the, the leading indicators of, of economic activity historically that lead you into recession, there's this composite of 10 leading indicators that the conference board puts together. Uh, it's in clear recession tor territory right now. It was down 6% in, in December, came out earlier this week. We've never had a, this, a decline this sharp without going into a recession subsequently. So our call is second half of the year is probably when you enter recession. There's still some dry powder on the household balance sheet. Uh, from from STEMI of the last couple of years that's being worked off that was really responsible for strong consumption in 2022. And I'll, I'll show you some detail on that. Uh, but once that is burned off, we think that's a second quarter story. The economy, I think, will start to throttle down in a more significant way. Let me ask, let me ask you yeah. real, real quick, just, just, a, just sure. a clarification there too. Um, I know that you and I had a conversation um, back, a few months back, and whenever we talked about recession, um, you used the term at that time, and I know things change, but you thought that it would be quote unquote shallow. Um, are you still feeling that way? Or is this because of this precipitous drop off, is this gonna be um, a little sharper than you had thought a few months back? And are, are, are you, you know, changing kind of your viewpoint on that? So what, well, again, what, you know, to the nuances, right? So our baseline is still, we're gonna see about a 1% decline in GDP growth. And this will be in the back half of this year. But where yeah. the pain points are, and, and this is a, a, something that, that I, I think I drew out last time we spoke on this too, but where the pain points are, the good sector in particular, where you had the over earning, where you had the overspending over the last couple of years, that's going to look a lot worse, right? You have maybe 5% plus in terms of correction on that side of the economy, but you have some services that still have to recover. You have healthcare spending, for example, that's 20% of consumer spending that still has to get back to the pre COVID baseline. You know, people put off standard procedures, elective procedures during the pandemic. That's only started to come back in a more meaningful way, sort of in the tail end of 22. So from a GDP accounting standpoint, you have some sectors. You have a very unsynchronized economy beneath the surface. But the pain point, again, I think, and the epicenter of the, of the, of the, of the damage is going to be in goods. We still expect to see a pretty significant uh, decline in goods. And I appreciate you guys being being patient with me. And, and um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not trying to ruin the flow here, but there's just some great questions that I want to ask. And if you get to these again, that's cool. But Peter, I want you to chime in here too for a second, as we pause the here for a second. So, you know, Jake, what you just said, um, you know, a 5% correction in the goods space. Now, our sector, we've talked about, and you guys have talked about how we've been ahead of the curve because we were sort of the first to dip in and the first to start to bounce back. So, so it, when we say that 5% in the goods sector, how much do we feel that that is uh, true to, uh, you know, retail home furnishings uh, at this point? Yeah, I was just looking at this data um, earlier today to update. So we do have some slides uh, later in the deck. Okay. Um, I know when I, um, uh, we, Jake and I were presenting to the CEO summit uh, back in late October at Pebble Beach, we had shown the slide, uh, it's back up a little bit right there, Jake. So um, this is, uh, 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 clothing and, and footwear sales, as reported, as uh, uh, by personal consumption expenditures, and the, the blue line lo looks at the absolute number. The orange line looks at the the pre-COVID trend from 2015 to 2019. You assume that the, the trend would be continuing. So the punchline here would be that uh, apparel and footwear is still 15% above trend overall. Um, looking specifically at at um, how the uh, BEA is reporting on furniture. Um, the the uh, furniture sales are still uh, six percent above trend. Now we had a, these similar slides back in uh, late October. At that point, we were actually uh, negative three percent below trend. So I updated this today and asked Jake, "Am I getting the right numbers here? Because this looks strange." So they they do revise these, um, and a lot of it is based just based on the uh, deflator uh, calculation that they do to to come to a real number. Um, and uh, Jake, if you just want to show the next slide. Um, I, so I take this with a little bit of grain of salt, but this is basically showing massive deflation in the furniture space as of late, which caused them to revise some of the, the numbers as of late. So it, what I would say is a punchline is furniture, in our view, when we look at the total goods space and the total retail space, still looks like it has corrected much more so than a lot of other areas, specifically like apparel and footwear, 
Uh, home improvement hasn't really corrected that much. Uh, general merchandise hasn't corrected that much. Um, so we're, the furniture space is well below those. You know, you, I'll put it to the audience. You may believe or not believe this uh, def deflation uh, uh, calculation. Uh, so I think it's kind of overstating uh, the furniture sales. I would suspect we are probably at or, or below trend uh, overall based on uh, even a lot of the survey work that we do and, and looking at sales trends on a, on a three-year basis. Gotcha. So I'm sorry to derail the the flow of the, of the whole thing, but I just thought it was important to kind of pause switch there. Jake, I'll, I'll send it back to you, but thank you for that clarification, uh, Peter. Appreciate it. Yeah. So uh, on on goods, again, you can we, we've we've tied this to uh, to be akin to what we saw um, ahead of Y2K. Peter, are you still there? I oh, am. Yeah, I know Jake's, uh, Jake's got in really late last night, so I know he's working from home. Um, so we'll, <laughs> we'll let him come back in. Probably has a slow uh, Wi-Fi connection at home. Got, gotcha. But, it, but we're, we've still got this uh, this particular um, slide up. While we're waiting for him, um, it's it's interesting too. And I want to. I know you're going to talk about this. You know, coming up in a few. But uh, you just put out the Q4. Furniture retailer um, survey uh, yeah. that you do in partner, partnership with us, um, and it's um, you know with what you just spoke about as far as um, you know where where we see the uh, uh, the corrections, if you will, in our in our space. Um, it certainly um, looks as if everything is truly continuing to slow um, rather dramatically. Is that is that just is that an a good word to use. I mean, it does seem that everything is really kind of, um, you know, really kind of pulling back. Is that is that a fair way to to assess that? Yeah, I think as it relates to furniture, uh, maybe mattresses as well. I, I would call it it's it's sluggish, uh, but it's not getting worse. Um, and so what what we saw in the in the survey data, and unfortunately Jake is the one controlling the slide, so we we'll show this. But you know, on a delivered basis. Uh, there was a drop off in the fourth quarter, um, and I really just think that's a function of the written sales were down in, in the prior quarters, and so your your fine retailers are finally uh, uh, shrinking the backlog that they have, and so the uh, there's now going to be a, a closer match between delivered sales and written sales. So delivered sales did drop uh, in the in the fourth quarter relative to Q2 and Q3. More importantly, if we look at the, the written sales trend on a year-on-year -year basis, um, Q4 uh, really was kind of right in line with, with Q3. It's sort of down, call it five to six percent. Um, so again, challenge is sluggish, uh, but not getting worse. And then in fact, uh, on average, when we asked retailers to forecast where they thought written demand would be in the first quarter, uh, the uh, the responses came back at an average of uh, down three uh, and a median response of down five. So uh, you're getting kind of still down, but at least if Q1 versus Q3, Q4 from the retail community uh, calling for some some slight sequential improvement overall. And you and it's interesting. I mean, you use the word steady, um, and I think that's that's kind of what you're talking about here. It doesn't mean that you know steady doesn't necessarily mean that it's that it's you know working its way up. But you're saying that the uh, the deficit, if you will, as far as this this you know demand and sales sales growth being down is is just kind of clipping along at about the same at the same pace. Is that uh, that's is that fair? That 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 is correct. Yeah. Um, yeah. Declines the declines are, are steady, not getting worse here. Okay. Gotcha. Jake, welcome back. You hear us okay? Oh, we don't hear your audio. So yes. You gotta, Sorry, I don't know what happened. I just lost everything. Okay, now we hear you. Yeah. Good. Good. All right. Well, we pick pick up where you left. We we filled the gap. We uh, Peter and I had our uh, put our tap shoes on and our uh, top hats, and we uh, we entertained for a few minutes, but we're good. But if you want to pick it up, go for it. Sounds good. Um, I can't share my screen though for some reason. I don't I don't know why. The the screen is currently shared, which is interesting. We're seeing that uh, 
uh, the stay at home bubble bigger than the tech bubble. Yeah, it just, um, it just froze there. <laughs> so I don't know what's happening with this. Um, so anyway, this is Caprice, who's in the background there, if you can um, uh, maybe, yeah, maybe take that down and then maybe Jake can reshare. Now I can reshare. Perfect. There we go. Thank you. We appreciate Technical. everybody's patience. Tech, hey, technical difficulties. What, what are you going to do? There we go. All right. See it again? Yeah, we got you. Okay, great. Let me just full screen this guy. All right, there we go. So, as yep. I was saying, I don't know when I cut off exactly, but I was tying this to a similar development that we saw during Y2K, right? We had a ton of pull forward demand uh, because of what was happening with technology at the time. This time around, again, we had people at home, a ton of stimulus thrown at them, uh, unable to spend on services. And so you had really the mother of all bubbles in terms of consumption on goods. This shows you real goods consumption on the right-hand side. You know, we were 15 to 20% above the norm at one point. And all we've done really over the course of the last year and a half is tread water. So some, some components have completely normalized, like furniture, for example, uh, like a lot of home goods and things like that. Uh, but other things, like Peter said, clothing, apparel, sporting equipment, that, those things still remain way above trend. So I think as we move through 23, and a lot of the elements of consumer spending that have been supporting spending in 22 unwind, uh, namely fiscal stimulus related things, the pain point is really going to be this correction in goods, this renormalization of how much wallet share consumers are dedicating to the space. Services recovers, goods sort of feels the pain, and you get a more general decline um, in, in spending overall. You're going to also see this play out in the labor markets, right? So along with the massive hikes, uh, spikes in demand, you had massive overhiring in all these areas that were very linked to this goods bubble. So you look at the sectors that, again, are linked to, to, to retail and, and this, this explosion of goods demand, we've overhired by about a million people relative to the pre-COVID baseline. So what's going to happen is when you see this rollback in demand, we see this normalization process in units, these companies are going to be effectively losing massive productivity. And what typically happens on the back of that is you get some substantial right sizing uh, in the industry. So when we look ahead to, to the dynamics of the labor market for 23, I think what you're, where you're going to see the biggest pain is in the areas that clearly overhired, that clearly over earned over the course of the pandemic because of the dynamics of the pandemic, because of too much uh, stimulus in the system. And you're seeing companies now already starting to respond to this, to this decline in real activity, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that gets buried beneath the surface every time we get sort of an employment report or, or every time you kind of hear uh, investors talk about wage growth, oh, wage growth is very strong. They're looking at it on an average hourly earnings basis, which is still elevated relative to where we were pre-COVID, but companies have been slashing hours over the course of the last three to six months. And so weekly paychecks, average weekly earnings for the household uh, level is down to 3.1% year over year. So you're basically where you were uh, when you went into COVID on a, on a broad wage growth basis. When you adjust this for inflation, then on a core level is running at 6%, although we think it's coming down strong in, in 23, you're looking at real wage growth that's running negative 3% right now. Again, a big headwind uh, for real consumption as we move through 23. So let's, so let's pause right there because there's a few things we've got to unpack. Um, first and foremost, um, when you talked about the uh, the uh, million one million jobs, you know that, that you know we overhired. Um, if you just look, <clears throat> Amazon is it laid off I think eighteen thousand. We're seeing a lot in the tech sector, but the point of the matter is, um, you just you know pick up any publication and you just see on the on the cover the fact there's there are a lot of cutbacks that are happening. So that's that's something. This wage issue, um, we're talking if if it's three percent below pre-COVID levels then that's got to just play directly into buying power, which is what everybody on this call is, 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 uh, is, is concerned about and always thinking about. So I'm assuming then we're talking about if you're going to, if we're going to have any clarity during this whole conversation about consumer spending, we have to realize that the income levels are wage levels are rolling back. And so that's, I mean, that's am, right. I, am I making, I mean, is, is I'm, I'm trying to connect the dots here. I mean, that, that seems really concerning. And, and the other element to this, so yeah, so when we model, you know, model consumer spending, essentially it's the organic means of consumption, which is wage growth, right? Compensation mm -hmm. growth, as we like to view it, because we, we take wages and then we take how many people are actually employed in the economy. So you're looking at aggregates. Um, net worth, what has that been doing? Because people respond to wealth creation and wealth destruction and, and sort of toggle consumption patterns on the back of that. 
So one, compensation growth throttling down. This is the bottom left chart here. And this is a combination of wage growth that has slowed to 3%, even if it holds there for the rest of this year. Uh, and employment, that's probably going to at least see about a million people in, ter in terms of job losses. In the, and we think it's a second half of 23 story. But if you factor the right sizing in goods, if you factor the slowdown in wage growth, you're looking at real compensation growth in the U.S. that's going to exit 23 negative. It's going to be negative down about half a percent. Um, then you factor in what's happened with net worth. Again, 2022 was a bad year for stocks, bad year for bonds. It's starting now to be a bad year for housing as well. Prices are finally declining, right? They're down about 6% over the last six months on an annualized basis. We think there's at least another 10% to go. But even without the housing declines embedded in here yet, we've seen net worth, this is the top left chart here, come down 7% through the third quarter. It's down about 10% when you look at the data through the fourth quarter. You've never seen net worth decline that much without a consumer recession uh, following. Right, so you've got the net worth piece, the wealth destruction, again, the inverse of everything that was happening during the pandemic when it was a rally in everything pretty much, right? You're seeing the inverse of that, you're seeing the popping of that, of that bubble. And so with these pieces alone, you're looking at a consumer backdrop um, that's, that's negative in the back half of the year. The other important point here though, and this is perhaps the biggest uh, toggle, for consumer spending as we move through this year, and it was the most important thing last year, is what the consumer ends up doing with savings, right? So if you look at 2022, one of the staggering things that happened was we went into the year with a 7.5% savings rate, right? As of November, and we'll get December data tomorrow, as of November, the savings rate was down to 2.4%. We had a more than 500 basis point decline in the savings rate inside of a year, which is unprecedented. That decline in the savings rate reflects people working off this excess savings that they accumulated during the pandemic, right? So if you look at this top left chart, this is the flow of savings and we annualize everything as, as economists, but these spikes here are the stimulus payments going out, right? So people were able to accumulate massive, they weren't, they weren't able to spend all of their stimulus money, right? So they accumulated, and this bottom chart is basically the aggregate of the difference of these two lines. So how much are you accumulating given that you've been saving much more than trend, and now you're saving much less than trend, this is now declining, right? So they burned off over a trillion dollars of excess savings last year. They have about 900 billion left. At the current burn off, this is gone in the second quarter. So you're gonna have a very different dynamic for consumer spending in the second half of the year versus where the first half looks. Now, the, 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 the punchline here is that this drawdown in savings, the decline in the savings rate last year, accounted for 70% of consumer spending growth, right? Whatever consumer spending did last year, 2%, 3% um, uh, real, 70% of that was because of the drawdown in savings. Savings, one, is getting burned off. So it's a completely different dynamic in the second half. Two, savings rates historically tend to increase when you move into an economic downturn. So we have some scenarios here on the bottom right if the savings rate were to gradually rise to three, which would still be extraordinarily low, right? Given where the starting point of seven and a half in, in 20, in, at the end of 2021, uh, you're gonna see an outright decline in real consumption that is not gonna be shallow. That's gonna start, then we're gonna start talking about a steeper slowdown. So the lever on savings and the, how the consumer behaves with respect to savings, once they burn through this excess from stimulus, once we enter an environment where the labor market becomes um, you know, there, there's, there's, there's concern about the labor market, there's concern about an economic downturn, savings rates go up. That's going to be a massive toggle for, for consumer spending growth in the back half of this year. And it's the biggest source of uncertainty, and it's potentially the biggest source of the downside. There's a you know, question came in, and, and it's, it, it's a good one. And I know that when we've talked prior to this webinar, you've talked about 23 um, being a tale of two halves. So you really, we really are, it sounds to me like I want to make sure this clarity because people are asking this, this question. So um, you're seeing it's going to be a, a, a little steeper drop off in Q2, but really the last half of the year is when you see all of these toggles, as you refer to it, kind of all coming together to, to make for a difficult second half of the year, regardless of how you look at it. I mean, is that, is that fair? I mean, is there any, there doesn't seem to be a lot of yeah, uh, light. Yeah, we, we just have, and, and look, even aside from this, right, we have just a lot of things lining up mid-year that are going to act as, as headwinds. We've got, we think the, the employment picture changes drastically. 
um, toward, toward, the ne toward negative. We think you'll start seeing layoffs in the second quarter, maybe the back half of the second quarter. Uh, again, so that compensation uh, piece begins to throttle down. Um, you've got the burn off of excess savings. This, this number will be at zero sometime in May or June. Um, and you've got still the unwind of a, of a ton of pandemic related programs that are still in place. For example, on, on the grocery spend side, you've got food stamps, which were expanded massively during the pandemic. This program gets turned off in March. The food stamps as a share of all grocery spend, gr food stamps account for about 11% of grocery spend. They were about 5% pre-COVID, right? So you have a huge step down normalization there once that program gets sort of reversed back to, to where we were pre-pandemic. This is still online. You have Medicaid that's coming off as well, and a big Medicaid expansion that occurred during the pandemic. We're running about $120, $130 billion above the pre-COVID trend. Medicaid as a share of healthcare spending went from 19 to 21%. That's unwinding in April, right? So you've got a bunch of little things that are lining up. The student loan moratorium, student loan payments are probably getting turned on in the summer, probably August at the latest. That's another $50 billion that's coming out of disposable income. Right, a lot of little things that add up to about one and a half percent of disposable income that are going to hit this year. You know, starting in the second quarter, leading into the third quarter, that line up with all these other you know headwinds on on, on the economic side. And, and Jake, here's a, here's a question that came in: Is the thought then that people took stimulus, combined it with their savings, and spent more, thus draining their savings for discretionary spending? Absolutely. Is that, yeah. So that's really what we're talking about here, right? A hundred percent. And Again, you have these other supports that are even exacerbating that, right? If grocery spending, if food stamps are now 11% of grocery spending, that means you have a lot more disposable income to spend on other stuff because SNAP right. is funding your, your, your food consumption two times to the extent that you were pre-COVID, right? So it's, it's, it's all these little things that are going to contract from disposable income that are going to exacerbate the weakness. And, and, and potentially squeeze out. The discretionary income for things okay. like home furnishings. So, Peter, I'm going to bring you into this to this question as well. You, and both of you can jump in, jump in on this. Um, so, generally speaking, when we see this type of a of recessionary time frame, we know that there is generally an uptick in um, uh, in the use of credit. And you know, most of our members, if not all of them, have you know offer in store credit and things like that. So these credit programs. And we know that during the, the heat of COVID, people were, were paying in cash. We know that the, the credit uh, usage kind of came down. Where do we see that uh, moving? Because, you know, I'm sure that anybody watching this is going gonna, is gonna to wonder how they, they may be able to strategize and, and adjust that part of what they offer to the consumer coming in the door. Sure. Yeah. I think one thing that Jake and I spoke about uh, back in, uh, in October at Pebble Beach was this debt service ratio. Uh, so it's basically the ratio of uh, in interest payments for the consumer uh, divided by income. And it's, it's, at, it's very much near all-time lows. And the reason why is because of a lot of um, you know, middle and, and upper income uh, households, the uh, homeowners, have all been able to refi into a sub 4% mortgage rate. Um, and so uh, the capacity to take on debt, the capacity to make interest payments to me still looks fairly robust. And so this was one of my kind of more bullish themes around the home furnishing space is that, yes, maybe you know, consumer spending is falling and, and savings is drying up. But for those that can tease out uh, financing offers, uh, the consumer certainly seems to have the ability um, to take on a little bit more debt. Um, now, the, the, we do see data too, banks are, are tightening up uh, some of that underwriting. So this is not gonna be for everyone, but we do think with those upper income, uh, middle and upper income uh, homeowners who, you know, to have a, a mortgage at this point, you've had to have exceptionally good credit for the last, you know, over the last 10 years. Uh, we do think there will be an appetite uh, to, to finance, particularly for those that can, that can provide the, uh, the interest-free uh, 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 financing over uh, you know, many months. Uh, we think that'll be uh, uh, very attractive. And uh, one other point on um, consumer spending that I, uh, maybe somewhat of a question, uh, but also a, a thought that I have is to Jake on the um, the goods to services, uh, because I'm someone that looks at furniture, I look at mattresses, but I look at a lot of areas of consumer spending. 
And really what we saw in 2022 was this violent shift back to services. You know, really the economy was kind of open back up. People were going out to restaurants. Everyone, my wife's a travel agent. It's busier than ever. Everyone's trying to book a trip. And, uh, and, you know, everyone has, you know, tried to get a reservation or book a flight. It's crazy. Uh, so it doesn't feel like an environment where the consumer is slowing. So do you think the, the goods piece did have a really tough 2022 because it was just the more of this reversion to the mean? Um, and we're still not fully back to normal, but, um, certainly that is one element that, that played heavily into 2022. And, and conversely, when you do go into a downturn, it, it is those things like, like dining out and, and, and vacationing that are going to get pulled back on it. And that's, that's only where the, the consumer has been pressing the, the accelerant in the, the last six to 12 months. Okay. So a little, little bit of a, of a, uh, a real good, um, yeah. Kind of flagging there basically saying with what we're looking at here this a little bit of a cliff coming um that truly your your in-store financing your offers like that this is the time to really button button those up make sure you've got the right kind of offers and aggressively go that direction knowing that um cash is going to be um a little bit of in short supply for for the consumer out there is that i mean i i don't want to overly <laughs> simplify things but i'm really good at that um but i wanted to i want to talk talk about that the other thing i wanted to ask you too in along the same line and i think jake i think you were going to talk about this a little bit as well um but um when we talk about credit i can't tell you personally and from a business standpoint how we continue continue to get bombarded with um uh, home equity uh loan um pitches um, you know, this, this you know, line of credit, push, push, push. Is that something that's also easing off right now as well? Or, or do we see um, some of these homeowners that have the, you know, the equity built up in the house because they've got that great low rate that they got a few years ago? Um, are we seeing them utilize those, those home equity lines? Or is that something that's also um, slowing down? Peter, I think you had some, did you have some slides on this? Yeah, why don't you skip ahead? Yeah, I'll. Uh, this is actually one area where I've spent a lot of time over the years to uh, declare myself uh, the the in-house Piper expert on home equity extraction. Um, so the um, the the reality is that when you look at home equity extraction, I do think it's an important uh, element of how people spend on their home, particularly with large remodel projects. But as you can imagine, anyone who's going through a, you know, a kitchen remodel or putting on an addition, you know, you, you end up buying more furniture to kind of fit your, your house. I've so certainly gone through that uh, dynamic the last two years myself. Um, and the, the two ways that you would do a, a home equity extraction is a cash out refinance, um, where you would reset your, your mortgage uh, to a new 30 year rate, uh, and you'd be able to extract equity out in that uh, refi process. Uh, the second way is a, is a home equity line of credit, uh, also known by the acronym HELOC. And, uh, and that's it basically a common, like, kind of like a second mortgage. You, you keep your existing mortgage and then the, the bank will give you a line of credit on top of it. Um, so for example, maybe you get a hundred thousand dollar line of credit and then you can tap into that as much as you want over a, a 10 year period. Um, what we saw in, uh, the, like 2019 to 2022, um, where you look at this graph, the, the blue bars represent cash out refi, orange is HELOC. You really saw a large majority of the home equity extraction dollars were done via cash out refi. And it, it's a great economic decision for the homeowner because maybe you could refi from a 5% down to a 3.5% and your home price was going up at the time. So uh, take out some, some cash and maybe put it back into your home. What's happened in 2022 is that the, the refi activity and, and therefore the cash out refi activity has collapsed because if you're locked in at a 4% or sub, sub 4%, uh, you really don't want to refi now into, into the, the current rate of about six and a half percent, um, and take cash out at the same time. And it would just balloon your monthly payments. So we're seeing this collapse of, uh, cash out refinancing. But what we are seeing is this huge uptick now in the HELOCs. Um, and, uh, and so you can see this a little bit with this graph. Well, we had a report out last week, and um, this is where I try to be a thought leader in the space, is that, here again, the problem with some of this data that gets reported, whether it's government data or bank data, is it's maybe not the, the exact measure of cash available or what's getting spent. 
so HELOC data is reported as an origination number. So I go, go back to the fact you got a $100,000 line of credit from the bank. You only need $30,000 to do your bathroom or whatever it might be. Um, so you're only going to take out 30000 but the bank is going to report that as a $100,000 origination. So the HELOC numbers that get reported are these really big numbers, but they're not really what's coming out of the uh, of equity. So we found with our banking analysts here that HELOCs generally have about a 30% utilization rate. Um, and so we've adjusted for that. We've applied a 30% to the HELOC originations. And so what we can see here now is really a collapse in the total dollars of, of uh, home equity extractions with cash up refi and HELOC uh, usage combined. So Jake, if you go to the next slide, this really tells the story of um, the uh, the year and year change. And um, so we're we're down, you know, r rather massively. It's you know, 30, $35 billion uh, year on year. And all I've done here is just say, okay, well, let's just take the most recent level and, and hold it steady for the next couple of quarters. Uh, that might be overly optimistic because the, the activity is coming down. But if we just hold it steady, um, you can see for the next couple of quarters, is the, the, the lines in orange, we're going to be lapping some big comparisons. We're going to be running down about $35 billion year on year each quarter. So by the second quarter of 2023, on a trailing 12-month uh, basis, it's about $120 billion less home equity that's going to be extracted on a cash basis. Um, I think this is meaningful. We're, I'm much more concerned about it in my uh, uh, view with like a Home Depot or a Lowe's. But here again, we do think a lot of this money does go back into the home. So there's going to be some element that does play into, into furniture and, and mattresses overall as people are refreshing and, and upgrading where they live. I mean, I'm trying to find, I'm trying to find some money here. Um, and um, that's, that trend is, is um, unbelievable to see how that, how that is just, how that is just really um, not just slowed, but just really, really dropped. So is there anything on this uh, HELOC line of things that, that is, that is positive at this point, or is this just going to be another sort of a, of a drag, a headwind as, as Jake calls it for, um, for the economy this year? Well, the question I've been getting asked by a lot of investors is, well, what's happening with that current HELOC utilization? The reality is that we don't really know. The, the banks don't report this, um, and they're all big publicly traded banks, so they can't just they tell me what it, what it is. Uh, our bank analyst was able to have some general conversations and came to the conclusion that it's, it's about, she feels it's about 30%. Go back to what I was saying before on the debt service ratio. There is an argument that the consumer can afford to take on more debt. They can afford to, to pay more interest. And so certainly we could see that that HELOC uh, utilization go from 30 percent, maybe to 40 to 50 percent. So um, I've always thought, you know, using your equity uh, to borrow with home equity extraction is a great economic proposition for the consumer because that equity acts as collateral and allows you to get a really nice rate, certainly better than what you might get from uh, from a standard credit card rate. Okay, appreciate that very much, and that, that clarity. Um, I think that's helpful uh, to anybody that's, that's that's watching right now. Um, obviously, Jake's got a little more technical issue here, so let me ask you a question that came in and something that I was going to get you to anyway. Um, you know, um, you talk, we talked about good home goods spending and things of that sort, but yet we've had reports recently that Wayfair, and you follow Wayfair, um, that they're seeing some improved trends, a little more growth all of a sudden out of all this. Can you put that into perspective for people to understand how, how that is happening, even with the concerns we're talking about and the downward trends and the slowdowns we're seeing? Sure. Yeah. So um, if you were to look at the stock chart for Wayfair um, over the last week, um, I mean, the stock's up about 65% year to date. Uh, I think it's up about 50% just over the last week overall. Um, basically, what's happened with Wayfair is they're on Friday, they've made an uh, announcement around a second round of, of layoffs. They're making another 5% headcount. And then they, they quantified uh, some of the, the cost outs that they're um, taking out of their business. So whether it's headcount or it's uh, initiatives to improve gross margin or just pulling back on some uh, spending around advertising and travel consultants, things like that. They're taking out about a uh, billion dollars of cost. Uh, this is a company that, you know, on 2022, when we see the full numbers, they're on track to lose anywhere from 430 to 450 billion dollars uh, of EBITDA. So they needed 
to, to make a change uh, and they were burning a lot of cash. So um, the stock moves, it's not that the Wall Street has really gotten uh, fully on board with what Wayfair is doing. Um, really what, what's happened here as of late is more what, what we refer to as a short cover rally. So the sentiment on Wayfair had gotten to be so negative because the results were frankly just awful uh, the last uh, 12 to 18 months, declining sales, negative EBITDA, burning cash, uh, that with that that short interest ratio, so the percentage of shares that are held by short sellers that are betting on the stock going down, had gotten up to about 35% near the all-time high. Um, and so, oftentimes, when you have really uh, highly shorted stocks and a little bit of good news happens, uh, people then want to bring down their short their negative exposure. And so, to do that, they have to buy the stock. And then, what that happens is it feeds upon itself. So. People start buying the stock to cover their short position, and more people are short who want to cover because the stock's going up, and it just piles on top of itself. So that's where you can see sometimes these big moves to the upside on stocks is really when there's this extreme negative sentiment, and that's been the case with Wayfair. I will say the other thing, not only on cost takeout with Wayfair, they haven't provided the exact numbers, but what they've said is that October, their sales were down about 10%, then November was a little bit better than October, still down, but not down as much. And then December was not down as much as November. So I know you can pick a number where they are. Maybe their December was down about 5%. In my view, I'll refer to the survey numbers we just ran for Q4. For all of 2022, and it continues with, um, 20, with Q4, the retail community, the brick and mortar retail community has been taking share. Um, and whether that's on a deliberate basis or on a, on a written demand basis, the sales have not deteriorated as much as they have at Wayfair or the likes of uh, Overstock, which is another one we can see. So I can agree, maybe Wayfair has fixed a few things. I think their pricing got out of whack uh, last year. I think their assortment got out of whack. They fixed some of those things and the sales are getting a little bit better, but relative to brick and mortar, they're still not quite as good. Uh, now we'll see if that, that, that improvement trend can continue in 2022, excuse me, 2023, but Look, the competition's gotten a lot better with selling furniture online. Like many people on the call here have really expanded their online assortment, um, okay. and you know, Wafer's got a much more formidable competitor base now. Well, and one thing, and one thing to point out from your Q4 report that just came out that it was sent out to to all of our membership is that um, you refer to online sales as still down but improving. Um, so when it comes to that online piece, clearly. Uh, that is still, I mean, it's not the lion's share for for brick and mortar retailers, but still, it's it is something that's that's showing some stability. Is that is that fair to say? Well, if we look at the online sales um, as reported in our survey um, specifically, uh, they were actually still up. Um, I'm going to try and find the report here. So the total total sales and uh, were were down. But the uh, but the online sales, I believe, still just grew slightly. Um, so it, it, again, it goes. I think a lot of retailers have gotten a, much better because you know, COVID forced people uh, to focus on uh, e-com, become a better omnichannel retailer, and those investments and those improvements that were made in 2020 and 2021 continue to pay dividends. And uh, so I think most retailers are seeing uh, the online piece of their business still outperform. And, and well, frankly, outperform the likes of Wayfair. And, and when we're talking about a really difficult 23, particularly the second half, you're going to want to have that omni-channel approach, that diversification. Uh, clearly, that's going to be a that's going to be a plus. You know, one of the things that uh, um, that somebody asked here that they just really asked, could you um, recap what you think um, that retailers, you know, should seriously consider doing on the credit side um, going forward? Because I, I think that I think that what we're seeing in some of these questions is that if we are talking about the tale of two halves of the year, um, it sounds like this is a cautionary tale to say you want to have things in place and be be really getting your your game together for the rough waters ahead. So so you talked a little bit about some of like the zero percent financing things like that. But what are the things that you're seeing that retailers should think about from that consumer uh, credit side of the of this of the uh, um, of the ledger here um, in this first half of the year? to sort of get them positioned for the second half. So I'm not a credit expert, I'm not a financing expert, but I've been kind of 
studying this long enough to at least have some opinions. Mm-hmm. Um, so obviously, the, you know, I think Synchrony is a, a great partner for many. Um, you know, interest rates are higher. I think there's a little default rates are up a little bit. Um, and so the cost of the credit is, is going up. And so we know that, that for retailers to extend, you know, five years of interest refinancing, that is a, that is a cost that they have to pay, uh, to synchrony that can eat a lot out of margin. And, and so that, that cost is going higher and higher. Um, in my view, I think it's still important to offer those extended interest free financing terms. They're very attractive. I think they do drive demand and they certainly can, uh, drive, uh, uh, ticket up, uh, cause people to trade up to uh, more expensive items. So my, my view is the way to offset the, uh, the higher cost is to um, work it so that, that it does require a down payment. Um, maybe it's a percent of the overall ticket. Maybe it's $500. Those are $1,000. My belief is you can uh, limit some of the cost inflation uh, with synchrony if, if the, the consumer has more skin in the game uh, when they buy the item. Uh, and certainly the amount that's being financed, if the consumer is putting down uh, 10, 25 percent of it, whatever the percentage is, uh, the overall uh, cost of that should should come in. So I just think there's ways to be creative uh, in order to keep the extended interest free uh, financing uh, terms over a longer period and requiring some type of down payment, I think, is is um, going to be important. And look. To get uh, interest-free financing in the last couple of years before, you got a pretty good income. you got to be a good credit standing. So I think people do have some money to, to put down small down payments uh, in order to make that credit available to them. And I think, you know, and I would be remiss not to say this, but, um, you know, clearly the recommendation would be, you know, you've uh, so many people on this call, um, you know, utilize um, our synchrony program and synchrony does a great job of, of being creative and 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 really looking at you know your situation market to market and um and really can can help so i really recommend you know go to the experts for that absolutely but i think what you're saying overall though is you feel there's going to be an appetite for uh for financing based upon all these economic indicators we're, we're talking about that is, that is that fair to say as far as just to kind of wrap that in a bow yeah that that i think there is there is an appetite and then if pick a number for the interest-free financing program requires consumer to pay fifty dollars a month. Again, you know, when we look at that debt service ratio, I, I think uh, the the consumer, particularly upper income consumers, middle up income consumers, can afford to take that on. Okay. Hey, Jake. Question: Since you're back with us, by the way, welcome back. Um, <laughs> the um, since you hit some of the uh, employment numbers and talked about that, and I know that's one of the many things that you follow, a question that came through um, was really talking about the fact that, you know, hiring and has been difficult uh, in our sector for uh, the last two and a half years plus. And um, so the question is, you know, will these layoffs in other sectors, will that have an, have an impact, do you think, on the overall labor market? Um, is there any, any thought to that? Uh, and, and maybe that's beyond uh, the data, but I'm just curious. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the bigger companies really outcompeted a lot of the small business, like the small business sector got crushed during the pandemic, and especially in terms of being able to find labor, in terms of not being able to compete on price in many cases, not being able to source inventory. Um, and so, you know, you look at a company like, we talked about Amazon earlier, right? Amazon was set to hire about 300,000 people over the course of 2020, 2021, pre-COVID, right? This was kind of their trajectory. They hired 750,000, right? So they hired 450 above trend with the, with this massive goods bubble that took hold, right? Um, and so you look at a company like that, you look at you look at the right sizing that has to happen in the areas that really overhired. We, we came up with a tally of about a million. That's going to free up labor, not only for small businesses that have been challenged, it's going to free up labor for the leisure and hospitality sector, which remains about a million below uh, the pre-COVID baseline. So you are going to get, in some sense, a, a rejigging of the trends that you saw over the past couple of years, where large goods companies really absorbed and really outbid other areas of the economy for labor because goods demand exploded to the upside so significantly. So I think the labor market dynamics, both from a labor supply loosening up, as you get this unwind in goods, and from a labor cost standpoint, given the supply loosening up, I think will 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 both be beneficial to areas that have been that have had trouble hiring people. Over the you talked about the wage. You talked about the wage decline, and one of the things that we just kind of skimmed over and mentioned that was such a um, a huge issue for all of our 
uh, all of our sector uh, in the early stages of COVID in the first year, of course, were the uh, incredible inflation in um, in the logistics part of the world, the shipping, the the you know all of that. Um, we're seeing a, a really profound regression in those costs, aren't we? I mean, those those have really. I mean, I've actually heard from retailers that said that some of the prices they're paying for containers is now less than it was in March of 2020. Is that are we seeing that being across the board? We we are, and you know, I, I can actually pull up something on that in a second. But you know, you look at container shipping rates; they're back to pre-COVID. You look at the West Coast uh, rates from China; they're back to pre-COVID. And it's interesting, you know, it's all part of this unwind in, in, in the goods bubble, right? Again, what we saw this morning with GDP, inventories are now very elevated. Imports are now declining sharply. And so you have the, the, the opposite of the big demand jump that you had peak COVID now unwinding. And so shipping has unwound with it. LALB ports, you know, this time last year had 109 container ships sitting off the coast, right? There, we were importing $80 billion worth of consumer goods in the first half of 2022 from a normal of about 50 billion pre-COVID. That's completely unwound. We just put in a, you know, we just took out the trend line now in the November numbers, right? So we've unwound that entire thing. And with it, we're unwinding shipping rates. Look at trucking demand, right? Trucking demand is back to pre-COVID in terms of sheer volumes. You're seeing trucking rates now inflect lower as well. They've inflected significantly over the last six months. And I think going forward the pressure is only going to be exacerbated to the downside because you're adding capacity into this market right and capacity usually takes time you can't you don't build containers overnight we're adding in 2023 and 2024 about 30 percent of the total capacity in container ships that currently exist we're adding that to capacity over the next two years in an environment where shipping is completely normalizing and maybe over undershooting what we saw pre-covid and so I think the, the cost the cost side from, from a logistics standpoint is going to ease up. Then you're also seeing pressures on the input side ease up. You look at core crude producer price inputs, negative 8% in November, negative 6% year over year in December, right? So all of that stuff, you're seeing a lot of alleviation. The further you look upstream, the more price uh, declines and outright deflation now you're seeing um, in, in, in the trends more recently. And I think that's only going to get worse as the consumer continues to throttle down. So as we talk about retail businesses, um, that's at least one thing on the P&L that on the expense side that we can at least hang our hat on that there's those costs are coming down. So at least it's, it doesn't counterbalance the, you know, where, where we're seeing sales trends and things like that, but at least it's one of the things that's pulling that other direction. So that's good to know. Um, before, I know we're kind of working our way toward a conclusion here, but Jake, real quick, um, should we be concerned about um, the push off of the debt ceiling issue uh, in Congress? Is that going to have any uh, impact on on consumers, or is that just is that something? Is that's a question that uh, that I had that came up, and I'm curious whether that has any impact. I think that's just I, I think that's just political theater. Um, we we see it we see it all the time. The Fed has mechanisms with which to push this off. Right, the real drop dead date for the for the ceiling is not until you get. Uh, really into the third quarter, deep into the third quarter, because they have all these provisions that they can change uh, to buy you more time, essentially, even though we hit the ceiling already. Um, and then the Fed can do a lot of things uh, with their balance sheet to, to, to put that off. I think it's it's more of the same. I mean, we, we, we kind of run into this uh, almost every year now, uh, but it's political theater. I don't think it's going to have any impact. At all. Okay, so you, you don't see it having any any profound specific economic impact on what we're talking about here today. So yeah. um, outside of impacting, you know, key bills that trade around that, Time frame? No. Okay, perfect. I appreciate that. I just want to make sure we get that I get to uh, tell the questions here. Peter, I'd like to, as we're getting ready to wrap up here, um, what are some other little nuggets that you'd like to like to leave our uh, our audience with uh, with today uh, that you're seeing from the uh, um, you know from the, the the retail sales side of this, et cetera? Are there any any other things that you want to really make sure that people are aware of? Well, look, I think the, uh, the the point about declining freight rates is something that, that I'm thinking a lot about as a stock analyst. Um, I think you know, sales estimates are pretty muted uh, for 2023, uh, whether it's you know, furniture names or, or, or other names. I'll give you a great example. I cover something like Yeti, right? They, they make the $400 cooler. I love their products. Here's my, my coffee cup today is a, a Yeti. Um, we can be a little concerned about their sales trend, 
but they've absorbed a massive amount of uh, of uh, f higher freight costs. Um, big bulky products coming in from Asia. It's it's nipped their gross margin by about 600 basis points over the last two years. So um, when we think about companies in opportunity, you know, sales are, are probably be a little bit challenged, but you know, are is there opportunity to actually grow your your margins and grow your EBITDA? And so, some, something like Yeti is a premium brand. We think they'll be able to hold price. And then now, these freight costs are coming down. Probably not just for 2023, but but will also come down and be a tailwind for 2024. So I think about that a lot for the furniture space. You're ship, you're importing big, heavy, bulky items, um, and and retailers have raised price in order to offset that. There probably will be a little bit of give back. But can retailers navigate this where they're still able to re retain some of that, those price increases from the last two years while their freight costs go back down to levels from two, three years ago, which would put them in a better margin and a better EBITDA position overall? Um, to me, that, that is a, as a stock or a company I would follow. That's a, not, not that bad of a, a, of a setup of just thinking about uh, the next uh, 12 to 18 months. Sure. Um, Jake, any final thoughts before we uh, before we wrap this uh, this program? No, I think that's right. I mean, I think look, we're we're deflating uh, the bubble of the last two to now three years because of way too much stimulus, and we we had this this bottleneck issue that led to an explosion in demand that was exacerbated by an explosion in demand. Now we have to unwind that bubble, right? And we're on the other side of this, and we still have some stimulus to unwind vis-a-vis -vis excess savings on the household balance sheet. And, you know, I think there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of how bad it could get for consumer spending in the second half as consumers yeah. kind of throttle uh, their savings behavior. I think that's the most important piece of this puzzle. Um, but, you know, we, we have no doubt that we're going into a downturn. We just, the doubt is how bad is it going to get, how people, and how are people going to respond? But as Peter said, and as we articulated on, on the cost side, it's also going to provide benefits, right? Both from shipping, logistics, input costs coming down, deflating outright, and then labor, right? Labor easing up, labor becoming uh, cheaper, in fact. Um, so on the other side of this, once you've gone through this painful normalization, as you unwind your over earnings really for the last three years, and a lot of these goods pockets, um, I think you, 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 can, you can sort of be back on a, on a, on a better trajectory. Well, we to be fair, the if, if you would stop sharing your screen, because we've got to show another slide. So I'm gonna have you stop sharing. And uh, bam, there we go. Uh, I want to just show a quick slide because coming up this weekend, uh, we have the Las Vegas furniture market. And if uh, there are those of you on this call who are planning to be there, please come see us. Um, if you're familiar with the complex, the center building is building B. We're on the 10th floor. Uh, 1050 is the address. Uh, we would love to see you there. Uh, many of our partners are there to, uh, to serve you as well. Um, and they can all help you navigate through uh, what sounds uh, to be like a very um, challenging and uh, in some cases uneven 2023 but i want to thank our, our guest today as always peter keith appreciate you as always for what you bring from the uh, uh, retail sales analysis standpoint and, and jake from the from the economic um you know point of view it, it's critically important and what i'm going to promise the audience is is we'll visit with you guys again um in uh in a few months and kind of keep on this because it is ever changing. And I think, um, you know, letting people know what these trends are, they can't really manage them unless they know. And you guys are, are measuring and you can manage what you can measure. So I appreciate that. So for everybody else, I just wanna thank you for joining us. We wanna wish you as always good health and good sales. And we will look forward to seeing you next time. I'm Mark Schumacher on behalf of all of us at HFA. Take care. <laughs>